and welcome back to Chit Heads. My name is Khalid and I am one of the learning navigators at Embodied Philosophy. We have a full panel of an episode today, which was previously recorded as part of Embodied Philosophy's Radical Teaching Conference. In this episode, Stephanie Kugliano, Hari Kirchnadas, Kenneth Rose, and Trish Tillman discuss the concept and role of the guru in present-day spheres of yoga and academia, the debates of the critics and proponents of guru system, and how the guru role may evolve in our unbounded modern time. We hope you enjoy. The concept and role of the guru has been much discussed in present day spheres of yoga asana, spiritual seeking within Eastern traditions and academia, as well as in their intersecting sub communities. Sometimes the misbehavior of gurus or those who claim to be gurus is responsible for the controversy around this idea. But other critics assert that the guru system itself is flawed and a safer model is merely to have teachers who are not imbued with claims of spiritual authority. Proponents of the system explain that the guru disciple relationship affords a deeper level of insight than the teacher student relationship. While critiques of the system often include charges of authoritarianism, rigid thinking and patriarchy. In this panel, scholar practitioners Hari Kirtana Das, Kenneth Rose and Trish Tillman will explore the role of the guru, the overlaps and differences between guru and teacher and some common misconceptions and how this role may evolve in our unboundaried modern time, modern times when ideas flow freely between East and West. So to get started, we welcome Hari Kirtana Das. Uh, Hari Kirtana Das. So today's panel will actually run with our, our three speakers, and we'll have uh, we'll hear from each of our three speakers for about twenty minutes, and then we'll have about thirty minutes of free conversation, question and answer. Um, so we welcome Hari Kirtana Das. He is a yoga teacher, spiritual mentor, and author of *In Search of the Highest Truth: Adventures in Yoga Philosophy*. He's also a returning teacher here at Embodied Philosophy. He's been practicing devotional yoga and various other yogic disciplines for the better part of the last 50 years, has lived in yoga ashrams and intentional spiritual communities, and has a talent for making complex ideas about spiritual philosophy easy to understand. Hari Kirtana is on the faculty of numerous yoga teacher training programs offers online courses and live workshops on the practical application of yoga philosophy, and is a frequent contributor to forums and magazines about the enduring relevance of yoga's ancient wisdom to life in the modern world. Hari's mission is to illuminate the many ways in which yoga, the yoga wisdom tradition can guide us towards meaningfully transformative spiritual experiences. And with that, welcome Hari. Okay, thank you very much for that very nice introduction. It is uh, an uh, honor and a pleasure to be back with uh, you here at an Embodied Philosophy uh, Forum. I'd like to begin by proposing that the goal of yoga beyond its modern postural incarnation is self-realization. And that the process of yoga is one of acquiring knowledge about the true nature of the self and knowledge of about how to develop expertise in practices that bring about the experience of one's true nature. This is highly specialized knowledge. It's like brain surgery. Uh, you wouldn't want someone who had not learned from an expert to be cracking open your skull and performing brain surgery. So similarly, uh, acquiring knowledge of how to ex develop expertise in practices that will take one to the experience of one's true nature and a proper understanding of what that true nature is, it requires a qualified teacher. And a problem arises when uh, modern yogis who aspire to travel down an authentic path of yoga don't know how to evaluate uh, a teacher in order to decide who can be trusted to impart that kind of knowledge. The contemporary phenomenon of charismatic teachers who prove to be unqualified or untrustworthy exacerbate the problem for sincere seekers of transcendental knowledge. So the question is what to do about this problem. Uh, for the next few minutes, I will speak to what I think 
one can do about this problem and what the yoga tradition has to say about uh, misconceptions about the role and qualifications of a guru uh, that are commonly found in, primarily in the Western landscape of contemporary yoga and spirituality. And I'll talk about why, contrary to some people's opinions, the role of a guru in the traditional sense is still very relevant today. One problem with modern Western culture in relationship to the yoga tradition is that we reflexively think we have to create something new in the name of progress. Uh, this desire to create something new is nested uh, or is uh, uh, born from what the yoga tradition tells us is Rajagun, the mode of passion. Uh, our aspiration as yogis is to rise to Sattvaguna, the mode of illumination or goodness, um, rather than creating something new, we can be looking for what is already there. Uh, and as the saying goes, they don't make them like they used to. Uh, we uh, tend to think of uh, progress, but what we think of as progress, yoga also tends to think of as regress, a further deviation from an established system for the acquisition of transcendental knowledge uh, that's already there. There is no need for us to create a new way of thinking because if we study and understand the old way of thinking, then we'll find that we already have a fully functional system that with appropriate renovations from time to time as needed is designed to work in any time, place or circumstance. Yoga epistemology, the theory of knowledge according to the Yoga Sutras uh, tells us that evidence of something being true consists of direct perception logic and authoritative verbal testimony. So to understand this system of knowledge and its relationship to the uh, role of the guru, let's take them in reverse order. Authoritative testimony consists of the word of one's teacher, the word in scripture and the uh, historical example of previous sadhus, or in other words, Guru Shastra Sadhu. Your guru tells you something. If the guru is good, they will tell you something based on a scriptural reference and they'll let you know where to find it. You can double check. Is, has what I've heard from my guru also spoken about in the same way in authoritative yoga scripture, like the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, the Yoga Sutras, etc. Uh, if yes, okay checks out. Now, have previous uh, sadhus, yogis, people living according to uh, standards of enlightened behavior, have they accepted this teaching and acted on it and gotten the result that's predicted? If yes, once again, we now have corroboration that what we've heard from our guru is uh, something we can accept as being reasonably true. Now, logic. Does it make sense? A philosophical idea or a prescription for practice has an obligation to be both sound and complete. By sound, I mean that it has no internal contradictions. Now, this is not the same thing as paradoxical or transrational. Um, it means that it doesn't chase its own tail. It doesn't uh, end up being in a place where you can't talk about it anymore because it's beyond words or some other evasive maneuver to not explain something. Complete means it can be practically applied in all relevant circumstances. So those are the two components of uh, philosophical logic, soundness and completeness. And if a philosophical proposition or teaching from a guru doesn't make any sense, to you, there's at least an even money chance that it doesn't make sense at all. So it has to make sense. If it makes sense, all right, we can accept that it might be true. And then finally, direct perception. Does it correspond to our lived experience? And not just our lived experience in our conditioned state, because yoga is presenting us with a theory, a theoretical proposition, and then an experiment that we can do to test the theory. So when we do the experiment, do we get the predicted results? If so, 
the theory is correct because we can confirm by our own direct perception that now what the guru has told us, it was true. So, so now let's step back to the first part of the process, which is hearing from a guru. Among the many elements of traditional yoga that have been difficult for Western uh, modern practitioners to assimilate, this guru-disciple relationship has been one of the most challenging and contentious, uh, so much so that uh, there have been many calls from the collective voice of modern yoga to banish the institution of guru once and for all. Uh, and it's understandable given uh, how many times we have heard of uh, trust being betrayed uh, by people who place their faith in bogus gurus. Uh, there are so many uh, that have been so flagrant and so injurious that uh, it's reasonable for a lot of people to think that no one takes the seat of a guru without having some ulterior motive for it. We have very high standards for gurus, but low expectations for, of people. Um, we think that a real guru has to be a flawless embodiment of a super conscious morality. Uh, and since no one is actually capable of such a thing, we think there's never really been any such thing as a real guru. Uh, but the uh, persistence uh, of human frailty, even in the face of good faith efforts at spiritual progress, to say nothing of conspicuously ego driven posturing, uh, compels us to think that perhaps this is the case. And so we develop resistance to the very idea uh, of a guru. Uh, and because we have good reason to have these kind of doubts, critical thinking about the place of a guru disciple relationship in modern yoga is a good thing. Uh, so let's consider the question first, who is qualified to be a guru? Arjuna asks Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita early on in the second chapter, how do I recognize a person who is transcendentally situated in perfect meditation? What is the language? of a person whose intelligence is uh, situated in transcendence. How does such a person sit and how would they move in the world? So we're giving, uh, we're given some indication of what to look for. Krishna responds by saying that someone who is free from the varieties of material desires that arise from the mind uh, and with a purified mind finds satisfaction in the self alone is a person who is understood to be situated in transcendental consciousness. So we find this little bit of dialogue near uh, about two thirds of the way through the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. And then again, in the 14th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, after Krishna has described the uh, three qualities of material nature of which I've spoken of two, Rajaguna, the mode of passion, Sattvaguna, the mode of goodness. The third is Tamaguna, the mode of ignorance. Krishna describes these modes and Arjuna asks, what are the characteristics that define someone who's transcendental to these modes? How do they conduct themselves? And how do you do it yourself? How do you transcend the qualities uh, of material nature? Krishna responds in uh, five verses from this 14th chapter and then in the 16th chapter elaborates even further on the characteristics of a saintly person, naming 24 of them. It's worth noting that Krishna speaks more in terms of character than knowledge. Uh, the behavior of a person gives more of an indication as to their spiritual advancement than the volume of theoretical knowledge that they may have memorized. So the guru is someone who is uh, the carrier and the embodiment of this transcendental knowledge, not just someone who's memorized a lot of uh, information. Uh, freedom from material desire, or at least significant progress in that direction, is the essential characteristic to look for in a guru. The next thing to consider is that, uh, like so many Sanskrit words that have been appropriated by Western culture, uh, the word guru has been uprooted from its original context. Uh, one of the literal meanings of the word guru is heavy alluding to one who carries and delivers the weight of knowledge. So it's reasonable then to ask what kind of knowledge is the guru heavy with? 
the guru is heavy with knowledge uh, that's found in uh, yoga wisdom texts, uh, and hence a genuine guru, as I said before, speaks the same truths that are found in such yoga wisdom texts, but from a position of realization or experiential knowledge, or in other words, the guru speaks from a position of wisdom gained from having uh, lived on the basis of those teachings. Then the next question is one of authorization. By whose authority does one become a guru? Who says that someone is qualified? Well, in traditional yoga, there is no such thing as self-authorization. A guru has to meet the standards set by their guru and then accepts disciples on the authority of their own guru. Uh, the authority of a guru is thus grounded in their position as a disciple of a guru who in turn is connected to a legitimate source of transcendental knowledge, like a link in a chain. Uh, the Sanskrit term for this disciplic succession uh, is parampara, meaning a system of one after the other. And Krishna speaks about this system of transmitting transcendental knowledge in the fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. So simply put, a guru is one who, by the grace of his or her own guru, uh, has seen the truth, understands it, accepts it, lives by it, and has the ability to guide a disciple toward an emulation of the guru's realization. The guru's instructions are pres and prescriptions are meant to enable a disciple to experience the truth for themselves. And this, of course, is very different from a materialistic guru who is compelled by ulterior motives and guided by the ethics of opportunism and becomes preoccupied with the prospect of making money from their disciples or having inappropriate relationships with their followers. Uh, so the problem is not with the traditional con concept of guru disciple, it's the modern materialist, um, materialistic conception of yoga that invites uh, opportunistic, charismatic teachers who don't have the qualification of spiritual advancement to market themselves as gurus or as gurus by any other name. Uh, an additional problem here is language. In the course of transplanting uh, yoga's spiritual culture into Western secular culture, uh, a few things have been lost in translation. Uh, and among them, uh, in addition to just the idea of who is a guru or what a guru is, is the guru disciple relationship or the difference between a guru and a teacher or an instructor. Uh, and the result is that the difference between a, a student and disciple is also lost. Uh, the conflation of guru disciple relationship with teacher and student relationship has only amplified the confusion about the nature of these relationships. Uh, a guru uh, is a teacher, of course, and is qualified in, in the ways that we've just spoken about and accepts a disciple based on the disciples qualification as well. Uh, it's not just the, that the guru has to be qualified, a disciple also has to be qualified. Uh, sincerity, humility, uh, determination, and the willingness to accept the discipline of the guru's prescribed practice. These are the qualifications that a disciple should have and, and a Guru doesn't accept disciples based on their ability to pay for services rendered, but rather on uh, the basis of their qualification. Uh, and that makes it very different from a teacher student relationship in modern yoga, which is basically a business relationship that ends when the transaction is balanced out. Student pays the teacher, the teacher teaches the student in proportion to the amount paid, end of story. Now, this obviously doesn't preclude the possibility or even the likelihood that a deeper relationship between a teacher and a student will develop. Good teachers are characteristically generous with their time and energy, uh, and good students become personally invested in their teachers. But just the same, a teacher-student relationship is fundamentally a professional relationship until it becomes something more, in which case the character of the relationship fundamentally changes uh, from professional to personal. The question is whether that personal relationship 
will evolve into one that's mutually beneficial or one that tends towards exploitation. There's a paradoxical verse in the Shvetasvatara Upanishad, uh, paradoxical in that uh, there's a mystical element being described in the guru-disciple relationship uh, that uh, illuminates a practical approach to vetting candidates on both sides of the relationship. And that verse goes, the true significance of these scriptures, the Upanishad that you have just read, is revealed to those great souls who are devoted in equal measure to both the Supreme Lord and to their guru. Now, at first glance, this may sound like a problem, blind faith rather than a solution, but a little unpacking uh, tells us that this Upanishad is a treatise on the perception of truth through purified senses. The proposition is that the guru is qualified by virtue of having mastered their senses uh, because control of the senses is key to controlling the mind. And uh, controlling the mind and senses is the means by which the mind and senses become purified instruments through which one perceives spiritual reality. So the restraint of these impulses uh, for material, uh, the pursuit of material desires uh, is your reason why yoga begins with ethical restrictions and purificatory practices. Uh, It's not just a matter of morality. The yamas and niyamas uh, set a foundation uh, for the means to gain access to the ultimate scope of potential knowledge. Which brings us to relevance. Why does any of this still matter? Uh, Because the root cause of material problems can be found in the absence of purified spiritual consciousness. And I don't mean that in a magical thinking kind of way. Spiritual culture includes the practical organization of one's life and the practical organization of society in such a way as to benefit everyone, both materially and spiritually. So just as a metaphysical thing, like an idea, precedes the invention of a physical thing, like a light bulb. Uh, Similarly, the spiritualization of culture precedes the creation of a peaceful and equitable society, including the implementation of policies by government administrators that benefit every member of society by virtue of being based on spiritual values. Remember, when Krishna describes the process by which transcendental Uh, the transcendental science of yoga is transmitted, he describes it as being meant for the Raja Rishis, the wise and saintly kings. So learning about yoga philosophy means learning about spiritual values and how to practically apply them for one's own benefit and everyone else's. Uh, And the best way to learn about the practical application of yoga philosophy is to learn from someone who really knows it, who is really living it. Uh, And therefore, This kind of relationship between a guru and a disciple in order to learn this transcendental science is still very, very relevant for the modern yoga practitioner. Thank you, Hari Kirtana. We will uh, move right along and introduce uh, our next speaker. Um, That's very, we have so much to think about already with that first uh, contribution, but we'll, we'll add to it here. Um, Kenneth Rose is a PhD author, speaker, and professor of philosophy and religion. He specializes in comparative religion, comparative mysticism, and spirituality. And he points you to his Amazon author page for more information about him, where you'll find titles such as Pluralism, the Future of Religion, Yoga, Meditation, and Mysticism, Contemplative Universals, and meditative Meditation Landmarks, and From Buddha to Thomas Merton, Wisdom from the Great Mystics, Sages, and Saints, among other titles. Uh, welcome, Ken, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Stephanie, for that uh, nice introduction, and thank you, Trish, also for the uh, original invitation. It's uh, really nice to be here with you this evening. Excuse me. Uh, And thank you also, Hari Kirtana, for that really illuminating uh, discussion of the concept of the guru, the reality of the guru. I think that's a 
that's a that's a, an understanding that is really not very common and it's very clearly traditional it's bhagavad gita based it's um, having been initiated by a guru by Prabhupada back in 1971 uh, my first uh, encounter with a guru i can that sounds very authentic to me um i so i really think that's a that is a, a concept and a notion that that we need to hear more about um, so I won't say much more about the, the spiritual role of the guru, um, because I think that we that should come out in our discussion. But what I want to talk about today is this issue of the spiritual, excuse me, the uh, scholar practitioner, which is a concept that's becoming um, more central, uh, I think, uh, maybe not directly among supreme premier academics, but among those of us um, not the people at the, at the top of the field, perhaps, but people who are connected out more into the into the community, uh, who not only teach in universities, but also teach in yoga studios. I think that the yoga studio teaching experience over the last 10 or 15 years has really been profound for many of us who were uh, immured in the academic world for so long, but who also are practitioners and who came into this academic world as practitioners. And then after decades of being within the academy, you can lose touch with that. But the yoga studio, when I was first invited, oh, 15 or so years ago to a small studio somewhere, I, someone must have looked me up on, on the university webpage. It was really quite a challenge to bring yoga philosophy, as it was called, to a, not to college students who may or may not have been interested in what I was saying over the years. You know, they, they would say, take rows because at least you won't fall asleep in this class. Uh, I had good uh, ratemyprofessor.com reviews. But suddenly sitting in a room with really serious intent people who had plunked down two or three thousand dollars in today's dollars for a yoga course and were completely skeptical, I must say, when I walked in and sat down. Um, who's this? What's he going to say? So having to learn how to reconnect like that was a great experience. I think a lot of us in, who teach in Asian religions, Eastern religions, who teach courses on, on Hinduism and yoga uh, have had this opportunity to, um, to evaluate this, this uh, uh, to evaluate what we do in light of being a practitioner. Um, since emerging in North American universities in the 1960s, the field of the academics uh, study of religion, religious studies, has lived by the principle that the scholar teaches about religion instead of teaching people to be religious or spiritual. The academic is a researcher, a historian, a social scientist, an area specialist, or a philologist, but not a guru. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But the uh, emergence of scholar practitioners in the academic study of religion is all, has begun to really alter that field. And it really started back uh, in the, I would say, the 1980s. Um, before I go on uh, and tell a couple of stories, I just want to say that the notion of a scholar practitioner is a really murky issue. You know, I've been thinking about this over the last uh, days and actually weeks since the invitation came. And every time I try to really uh, find a covering concept for the, for the scholar practitioner, uh, the ground shifts under my feet. It, it's a loose concept, I would say, to, to coin a new phrase. Um, uh, what I really found helpful was reading uh, the issue of Tarka that Stephanie um, edited and that uh, uh, Trish, uh, I don't know what your involvement was, but I read your article as well. I must say this was an extremely helpful issue to read. I just reread it and uh, I found a lot of inspiring and insightful thoughts there. Really, I, that should be published in the AAR, the JAR, I think, because we need to have that discussion in the field. But it's a really uh, loose concept. It, it's loose in the same way that this perennial discussion in the academic field of religious studies uh, concerning what is religious studies about? What is our methodology? What are we really doing as religious studies scholars? And because it's so loose and that no one has come up with a, a way of, of, of defining that, all you have to do is take a look at presidential speeches 
in the uh, Journal of the American Academy of Religion over the last 30 years or so. It's as if every new president of the AR, there's a new one every year, gets is animated with the desire to try to say what it is we're doing as scholars. I won't go into all of the different theories about um, what it is religious studies scholars should be doing. Uh, I take that up in, in some of my books. Um, and it's a, really, uh, it's a really interesting and provocative discussion. Um, but I think one way to approach it is by telling a story to really show the difference between the scholar the practitioner, and maybe the blending of the two. Charles Prebish in Lion's Roar, oh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, uh, wrote uh, an article uh, that was called The New Panditas. Uh, that was back in 2006. And he tells a story, um, and perhaps I think many of us have heard the story, that when he was a new grad student at, at Wisconsin in 67, which is starting to sound like a really long time ago, he said he heard his first scholar practitioner story. It was uh, about a time when Edward Kahn's, who was really one of the most renowned Buddhist scholars of his generation, uh, visited uh, and he gave a talk. And apparently Kahn's was a very blunt and forthright uh, uh, and, and uh, outspoken person. And he was asked at one point, uh, Dr. Kahn's, do you actually meditate? This was 1967. Yes, Kahn's replied. The student, curiosity peaked, pressed on. Ever get anywhere? Khans responded brusquely, first trans state. First jhana. First trans state. The audience was shocked. They didn't know what to make of this. The idea that a Buddhist scholar would actually be a Buddhist and a practitioner was astonishing to uh, even the students in those days. I think a story like that really is useful for showing really how far we've come over the years, especially, especially in Buddhist studies. Um, when I first went to grad school, it was 1982. Um, and when I uh, first entered the program, um, it was curious uh, how the field was arrayed in those days. It was a divinity school. So it was, uh, there was, of course, the, the divinity school, with, which was training ministers and future, future uh, theologians, uh, biblical uh, study and biblical studies, theology, and so on. And then there was this other group of people who were there in the religious studies department, the study of religion, as it was called. And they had a different array of motivations for being there. They didn't want to be ministers. Um, they didn't want to become theologians. It was a, I don't know, I don't have any numbers for it, but there was this division amongst our, these cohorts of grad students in the early 80s between the uh, future, many of, many of these, of course, these the members of my cohort teach all over the place now. And, and at our age, they're in very eminent positions, many of them. And there was uh, many of them were only interested in religion because they had taken a course in college or they'd had an inspiring teacher or they were traveling in Asia and they they were curious about the language or the culture. And for them, the study of religion was really something that uh, they were concerned with religions aboutness. But what is it that makes religion? What, is, what are the social conditions that make religion? How did this text arise? What is its history? Um, what are the what are the ideological pressures that shape the text to be the way it is? So there was that group, and then there was this other group of us who actually began to spill into the divinity schools, the, the liberal divinity schools, the university uh, theological schools. Um, and we were people who had been in the Hare Krishna movement and had been with all the gurus who had been coming to America since the mid 60s. And suddenly, for some reason, many of us had this desire to study what we were doing academically. And of course, we had no idea what kind of a world we were going to be getting into by going into the academic study of religion. So we were the converts, the enthusiasts, we were the practitioners. And you know, one of the articles in that journal shows just what it can be like when you come as an enthusiastic practitioner into the academy, <laughs> especially back then when there were virtually no scholar practitioners uh, uh, whose field was Buddhism or Hinduism, or uh, and those were the main religions being studied other than Christianity, Judaism, and to a much lesser extent in those days, Islam. And so the expectation was on the part of the professors of religious studies was that you would be a person who studied the uh, religion, you, you studied about religion, you didn't participate in religion. If you participated in religion, you were most likely Christian. 
uh, you, if, given that it was a divinity school, virtually all of the professors were Christians. In fact, all of them were Christians. It only it was actually a decade before we had a we had so we had there was the beginning there were Jewish studies professors, but beyond Judaism and Christianity, and that was new. There was uh, there were there was nobody there who was a Hindu who was teaching Hinduism or studying Hinduism. No one who was a Buddhist who was a, 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 who was teaching uh, and studying Buddhism. But among the new cohorts of grad students, there were lots of converts. And this was perplexing to the professors and it was perplexing to us because we thought for sure that here we were going to find perhaps academic versions of our, of our gurus. And it was a completely different world. Another one of the articles um, uh, really in that, mag in that journal really showed, um, shows what hap can happen to a grad student. Um, you have to get through that. It's a different world. It's actually, if you will, it's kind of like a different religion. And you know, we, have, we have our academic deities. There's Rorty. Rorty, I, I mean, Foucault, you know, you can always tell that someone has really kind of gone over into the academic religion when in an article criticizing as naive some practice that Asian teachers brought to the West, uh, maybe they brought us the mindfulness practice, which apparently was only invented in, in Burma 100 years ago. Um, or people who think that Vivekananda is a neo-Hindu and so therefore is somehow suspect as a Hindu. You can tell who the authority is for such uh, scholars when they quote Foucault or Rorty or someone like that by simply saying, as Rorty says, now I'm a philosopher. That's called an appeal to authority. <laughs> There's no critical contextualization. Rorty, as a philosopher and as a scholar, I would say, and you know, Rorty has said, but what was motivating Rorty? And is Rorty's argument correct here? So that doesn't happen. You and I often find that uh, scholars will quote some uh, Western critical or philosophical authority without subjecting that authority to the same to the same sort of critical critical scrutiny that they are uh, applying to the um, to the traditional text or the traditional movement. So in 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 um, in the divinity school where I studied. Um, until decades later, there was really no one, all, everyone who taught Hinduism in those days was a Christian. And it makes sense. They were liberal Christians. They, you know, they, they were totally liberal. They were progressive Christians. They were not the kind of Christians you were going to run into on every day on the street. A lot of them had come from missionary backgrounds. They had grown up in families that were, had lived, grown up in the Middle East and elsewhere. They were conversant in the tradition. They grew up in the traditional cultures, but they were still Christians. And their interest um, was no longer a missionary interest. Their interest was interreligious, but nevertheless, they were Christians. They weren't Hindus teaching these traditions. So these, uh, they were scholar practitioners, but they were practitioners of a different religion than the one they were studying. And it was, it seemed in those days normative, especially for someone who studied Hinduism to be a Christian or to at least not profess any religion. It seemed odd. It seemed almost indecent in a way to come and sit in a seminar with people like that and to say, well, you know, when I was um, with my guru or, uh, and they, if the reaction was almost as if you had committed some kind of a, an egregious uh, uh, faux pas, because we just didn't do that. We study Hinduism, we don't practice Hinduism. That's changed, especially that was changing already in Buddhist studies in the 1980s. That's completely different. I don't have numbers for it, someone, uh, but it's pretty clear that in Buddhist studies, Many, many, many of the practitioners, many of the scholars are also practitioners. I think it's different in Hinduism. It's still, it's changed. There are more uh, uh, Indian, uh, there are more scholars of Hinduism who are Hindu and of, of, of Indian descent um, than there was, than there were in the past. But I think what's changing Hindu, uh, Hindu studies as well are people coming from uh, the, uh, the yoga studies. I think yoga studies is really shaking things up. It's bringing different perspectives into, into how to study uh, the traditions of India because invariably people who come in from yoga studies are practitioners. It's, it would be impossible, I think, to, to just be a person. So I, I'm sure you could do that, um, but it, it would be very rare. So the, um, but what was interesting uh, in those days is that no one questioned that every person 
in uh, the divinity school who taught or studied Christianity or Judaism, they were all scholar practitioners. All of them. There, there, in those, there was the first person I knew, a, 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 a woman in the cohort I was in, uh, she was Jewish and she was one of the first people to try to study and to teach Christian theology. And that was a pretty dramatic step in those days. That was a first. Um, but they were all scholar practitioners and but it was ex it wasn't expected that if you were studying Hinduism you would be a scholar practitioner and this has to do with the fact that um, the the field of religious studies um, uh, was uh, was um, it arose as a as a result of liberal Protestantism's attempt to try to overcome exclusivism and so there was the, there was, and to overcome the apologetic kinds of comparative religion and comparative theology that had been the case with McNichol and, and Freeman early on, and then later led to the, the downfall of comparative theology with, uh, with, um, with Hendrik Kramer. It's almost as if after Hendrik Kramer, nobody wanted to go near the topic any longer. And the divinity school that I was in, of course, differed very much from the Chicago approach of Iliada in those days, um, which uh, was seeking to create uh, Iliada in his last uh, writing seemed to be moving toward a universal humanism grounded in archetypal spirituality. That was completely alien to the mentality of where I went to went to grad school. Um, and uh, that whole approach disappeared after Iliadi's death. You would be very hard pressed to find anybody in Chicago today, I'm sure, who thinks like that. So the study of religion had its start in places like Chicago, Harvard, and elsewhere. Um, and where I was, it was an attempt to do interreligious theology um, without promoting or placing Christianity at the center. And one of the odd features then of, of that period was that Christianity was rigorously excluded from the study of religion. In those days, you really couldn't find in a religious studies department courses studying Christianity. That came later. It was actually a revolutionary move when uh, some religious studies scholars began to study Christianity using the same tools that they used for Hinduism, Buddhism, and so on. So there's been a real sea change over the decades uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the relationship between um, the scholar and the practitioner. Um, and so, uh, so this, this whole issue of the scholar practitioner um, raises the question of methodology. Um, are, you, uh, are you studying, uh, when, you, when you approach religion, are you teaching people about religion or are you teaching them how to be in a religion? The about or in distinction. Uh, this is a subtle difference. It's often difficult for people outside of academia to appreciate. I think even inside it's certainly the case. I know in my old department, we had a, it was a religion department, but we had a lot of, a lot of evangelical Christians in our religion department. And they just, the idea that I studied, I studied about religion as a religious pluralist was something that just never registered. It just seemed to them that I was just following the pluralism religion and that I was there to teach, to undermine true faith and give people my academic liberal faith of pluralism. You know, actually, when you look at it from the standpoint of their perspective, there's a lot of truth in that. I'm just, I've been schooled in, in pluralism and I'm trying to teach people to be pluralists. That's why students often said to me, and some of you who've taught in universities, college, undergraduates will have had this experience every semester, at least one, if not two or three students would say, Professor Rose, I want to let you know that my grandmother's praying for me because I'm taking this course. Whoa, I heard that every semester for 30 years. And it's had a sobering effect upon me because I realized I had a great deal of responsibility as a professor of religious studies with young people coming from totally non-pluralistic backgrounds and uh, how to deal with that. Um, it, I, my, my own background was not consoling to them at all. My pluralist religious journey, it, to them, it was as if I had joined a, a cult or an alien religion and now I was trying to indoctrinate them in that. And many of their parents felt that way as, as well. Um, sometimes when I would go to, to get a haircut in, in the small, the, the, it's a big town in, in Virginia where I lived for many years and taught, 
and I would get I go to get my hair cut, whatever, there's not much of it left now. So, um, and the person, a local person would ask me what I did. And I would sometimes say, oh, I, I teach over at the university. Well, what do you teach? Oh, this was always the question I, I knew was coming. I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know, deflect it by just easily saying philosophy, because that usually just stops the conversation. Oh, philosophy, a cogito ergo sum or something like that. That's, that's pretty much the end of the conversation. But if I said religion, oh, and the response was inevitably the same. It was usually delight. Oh, great, wonderful. Because they just assumed they were often very religious people. They just assumed that I was teaching people to be a missionary or to teach them to, to take the true faith somewhere and to, to deepen it. I never quite knew how to, how to break the news to such people that that's not what I was doing. So I usually just engaged in some small talk and tried to change the subject. Um, so the, um, so the, so that's, the, that's the issue with, with scholar practitioners. Um, one of the issues is that we can often not know ourselves. And that's why I said this is a very slippery concept. Am I teaching people to be religious in some kind of unknown liberal pluralist way that undermines their beliefs and I'm replacing them with liberal religious beliefs? Or if I were not a person with my background and I had a purely secular interest in religion, maybe I were a materialist and an atheist and for some odd reason I got interested in religion, then would I be trying to replace their religious beliefs with just materialism and secularism? Is that an improvement? Is that something I really want to do? So um, that, 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 that's why I said this is an issue that does, does need to be more deeply studied. Um, and it, another point I would make, uh, and I think I have a couple, maybe a couple of minutes left. Another point I would make is that there are problems with, with um, practitioners, obviously non uh, scholar practitioner practitioners can be suspicious of academics because they think that what we're doing is just mind games, conceptual mind games, distraction from practice. And then, of course, the a problem that they may have also is just uncritical acceptance of teachers or teachers or methods, not having any, as Hari Kirtan, no clue as to how to evaluate a person who presents themselves as a spiritual teacher. Um, no clue. And then, of course, there's always the problem of the kind of the first, if you're in a spiritual crisis, the first person you meet who has something wonderful to say becomes the one truth forever in your life. And so kinds of so various forms of naive religious exclusivism that can be very hard. And it's not just among um, fundamentalists uh, and others. It also happens in spiritual movements very intensely. People just become completely fixated upon the idea that they have the one truth. It makes you feel special. And I've been I've been an exclusivist in two religions, so I'm pretty much I'm not pretty much an expert at overcoming it. And then, of course, there's the academic exclusivism which someone in that journal article really wonderfully, a couple of people wonderfully got at that aspect. And I'll close with just a couple of other, just another point or two problems uh, with, there are actually problems, it's not all great with spiritual scholar practitioners because they bring their own problems as well. And this comes from being initiated deeply into the academic mindset. They're prone to scholarly revisions and discrediting of popular traditions. So um, they speak about Buddhist modernism and that meditation wasn't widely practiced by lay people. Medi mindfulness meditation was invented in colonial Myanmar. Hatha yoga, as we know it, is a 19th century invention. Vivekananda was a neo-Hindu. Religion is an invention of the scholar's study. Hinduism, like India, was invented by the British. And these make for, I mean, much of our field is actually dominated by people at the top who do this kind of scholarship, which I find often to be utterly irrelevant to people in the traditions, tendentious, not always so deeply researched, and, and ultimately not as constructive as it, it, it creates this, this sense of academics being in our own bubble with our own ideology that we want to promote. 
Um, and of course, there's the there's the, the historical approach rather than looking at the, the meaning of the traditions. I'm a philosopher, not a historian, so I'm very sensitive to that. There's the thraldom to Western ideologies and critical methods, the coding of some Western expert as if that person suddenly had unquestioned authority. Um, and uh, and one other shocking, a shocking, um, a shocking, what I find very disrespectful is that many people in my generation who profited from many of the so-called amateurs back in the day, Alan Watts and Paul Reps and um, Lama Govinda, there's so many of them. Uh, and that today scholars, of course, they look down on them as being amateurs and have, having purveyed some kind of Western watered down. And many of these people, they did what we can do today because they were these lonely, isolated eccentrics who, who pursued that path. And so there's much more that I could say on this topic. And I'm just getting started, actually. Maybe there's another book in this. Thank you for letting me uh, uh, share this with you. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you, Ken. Um, I appreciate your reference to the Tarka Journal in there um, and your own contributions that you've made over the years to embodied philosophy and to Tarka. Um, so many, so much rich uh, material there to think about in terms of the role of the guru and how that links to uh, the project of the scholar practitioner, the concept and the issues um, and, and questions that surround kind of the role of the academy and and the role of the teacher. Uh, we'll move right along here to uh, Trish and hear from a third voice on this uh, really fascinating and broad topic. Um, there's just, um, like Ken's saying, there's probably material for, for a book in this conversation. All right, uh, welcoming Trish Tillman. Uh, she is a history professor and yoga teacher in the Washington DC area. She holds a PhD in history from the Catholic University of America and currently teaches at the University of Maryland Global Campus. She teaches yoga for and helps to manage district flow yoga in downtown DC near Capitol Hill. She is also the wisdom editor at Embodied Philosophy. Since completing her original yoga teacher training, Trish has been steadily involved in the study and practice of bhakti yoga via her teacher, Hari Kirtana Das. Uh, welcome, Trish, and handing it over to you now. Can everyone see my screen? Yes? Yeah. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so yes. I was kind of uh, counting on Hari and Ken on introducing some preliminary topics so that I would have to uh, frame things a little bit less. Uh, so it kind of works out nicely for me that way to put myself last. Um, so hopefully they introduced like the realm of some of these present day predicaments for everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about a little microcosm of larger debates over the role of the teacher, the guru, and then also uh, women's roles. So Women's roles are, for whatever reason, uh, still in a little bit of debate. Uh, plenty of people will say, like, well, there should be just unquestioned equality for women. Um, nonetheless, in various institutions, this is still something that has to be pushed for. And um, in ISKCON, in the modern day Hare Krishna movement, there has been definitely an interesting journey uh, to having female initiating gurus. And it's nice because it's a little bit of a microcosm of this issue in the larger world of religion and spirituality, I would say. So in various religions and various spiritualities, people have been striving towards women's equality throughout the 20th century and even before. And this is uh, just one kind of instance of it. There, there are other institutions uh, that are ahead of ISKCON. And there are other institutions that are, well, definitely behind. So when I say ISKCON, I mean uh, the modern day Hare Krishna movement. So um, the Hare Krishnas are what they're better known as. If you wanna be more technical, um, you could also call them Godaya Vaishnava, uh, well, Godaya Vaishnavism. Um, oftentimes they don't refer to them as Hindus, but to a lot of people, they would fall within that umbrella. So one wrinkle that 
Hari didn't introduce that I wasn't sure if he was gonna talk about or not is pretty key to this whole debate. So in the Hare Krishna movement and in a lot of similar traditions, there are actually two types of guru. Um, so there is a shiksa guru and a diksha guru. And your shiksa guru is anybody, well, not anybody, is any significant teacher on your spiritual path. So basically you can have multiple uh, shiksa gurus and they are instrumental to your spiritual progress. They still have to be qualified, but it's a little bit more loose because you can have many such individuals. But this, uh, this figure of the Diksha Guru is the initiating guru. So this is the person who actually hands down this chain of disciplic succession or parampara that Hari talked about. So this initiating guru, um, you can typically only have one of them and it's this very special role. So basically within the Hare Krishnas, you could have um, these shiksa gurus, be women, be men, be whatever, but previously you couldn't have a female initiating guru. So uh, just to start with a quote, um, it's interesting that this was even an issue at all in the Hare Krishna movement because the idea of having separate roles for men and for women seems a little bit contrary to the whole theology of bhakti yoga. Um, so you see many varieties of this kind of quote from Prabhupada, from the founder of the Hare Krishna movement in the West. You see these kind of quotes like, uh, so the body is not eternal, but actually every materialistic person is engaged in the bodily activities. He's acting as American, why? Because his body is American. He's acting as Indian, why? Because his body is Indian. He's acting as husband because, it, because his body is male. He's acting as a wife because the body is female. So you take all activities due to the body, but if the soul is eternal, then one should seek, then what is my eternal activities? The body is not eternal, therefore these activities are also not eternal. Then what is my real activity, eternal activity? That is Krishna consciousness or bhakti. So you have this idea that these differences um, in nationality, in gender, these are all characteristics of your temporary material body. That's not your spiritual soul, which is your true nature. So you're looking at this, you're like, if uh, you know the body isn't the main thing, why do you have these differences between men's and women's roles? Um, so nonetheless, this was an issue. Um, just to start out with, like the theology is pretty egalitarian of bhakti yoga, um, even as you're going into it. Not only that, um, if you look at uh, bhakti yoga, Godaya Vaishnava theology, you also have this very exalted role for women, okay? Um, so a lot of religions, a lot of spiritualities are kind of, they grant a sort of begrudging equality to women, or it's this kind of like women are, women are good, but mm, uh, in Vaishnava theology, there is a very exalted role for women um, if you take after the type of Radha, the consort of Krishna. So you often hear of Krishna and Radha, the original divine couple, and Krishna is the original form of God in this system. And then Radha is not merely Krishna's consort or kind of his associate. Um, Radha is also taken as God. So Krishna is the masculine Radha is the feminine form of God. Radha is even supposed to be so powerful that Krishna is known as the all attractive one. And then Radha attracts even uh, the all attractive one. So she even has this power to attract Krishna. Even in the painting, you see Krishna um, is kind of in this posture of supplication to Radha. So it's definitely, this kind of uh, very egalitarian view of their roles. Even if you think of the history of uh, Godaya Vaishnavism and Bhakti Yoga, 
uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the 1400s and 1500s is often spoken of as the incarnation, not just of Krishna, but of Radha and Krishna together. Um, so he is both of these divine personalities. So the feminine definitely has um, an equal share in the divine. So if you extrapolate from that, why should women's voices not be equally heard? So if you're going into um, ISKCON, into the modern day Hare Krishna movement, another uh, kind of interesting nuance of this is that um, a lot of devotees, well, obviously in the West, they're Westerners, um, and they're coming into it with their own sets of frustrations, uh, a lot of times their own religions of origin um, that they might have some trauma from. Um, so a big parallel with the push for uh, female initiating gurus in ISKCON is the push in the Catholic Church uh, for women's ordination, say. So these are both kind of unfolding at the same time. Within the Catholic Church, since the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, there's been uh, a pretty loud and steady outcry for women's ordination. Um, one difference between this debate in the Hare Krishna movement and then the Catholic Church is that the, uh, the roles of like the priest and I guess the guru or disciplic since succession uh, in ISKCON, they're a little bit uh, uncoupled. So in the Catholic Church, you have priests and bishops. They are this, this both kind of sacramental role, and then they also have the disciplic succession attached to them too. Uh, in ISKCON, you have this priestly function uh, of deity worship, that's the pujari, um, of which you can already have female pujaris uh, in ISKCON after a period of time. And then separately to, separate to the Pujari is the initiating guru, the Diksha guru. Um, so that's really the kind of debate. Uh, there was also a push to have female Pujaris and so forth. And that's also much more practiced uh, in the Hare Krishna movement in the West as kind of a, uh, as kind of a nod to more Western values that Westerners have more of a desire for equality. Um, so it might be dangerous to put too many parallels between Catholicism and uh, the Hare Krishnas in that way. Just if you see terms like priest uh, or disciplic succession, it definitely doesn't mean the same exactly in these spiritual systems. So with uh, Srila Prabhupada, the founder of the Hare Krishna movement in the West, you get this problem that people often refer to um, of apparently his wildly divergent views on women. So in the original Hare Krishna movement, as you can see in the picture, there were many female disciples and by their own reporting, they seem like they had a really positive experience with Prabhupada. So by a lot of people's accounts, he spoke to his female disciples in a respectful way. Um, they spent equal time with him to men. They traveled around the world. They were secretaries, they were editors. They served all these roles. Um, and he even encouraged them to kind of develop their talents and what have you. So Prabhupada challenged a lot of, uh, a lot of like previous suppositions on women's roles. And already he extended uh, to women roles that weren't really previously available uh, in good Aya Vaishnavism back in India. So for example, there is a quote of Prabhupada. Um, he says to a room full of his students, I want my disciples to all open temples. And like a teenage girl says, well, even the girls? And he says, yeah, why not? Even the girls. Um, so women can be temple presidents. He said in an interview with a professor who asked him, can a woman become a guru? He said, basically the same thing, sure. Um, anyone who has attained perfection but can, can become a guru. So kind of echoing Hari, it, uh, it's not about, well, this kind of outward form, it's about qualification. 
as we'll talk a little bit more about. So on the one hand, you have all these positive experiences. And then on the other hand, and these are also very uh, well reported, you have uh, the problematic Prabhupada quotes. And I won't go into all of them, but um, a lot of them are centering around his commentary on Bhagavad Gita, uh, 140, which is about the degradation of women and a family life. So he says things like women are uh, like children or they're more prone to be misled. Um, they're easily corrupted. Um, he says a lot of kind of infantilizing um, and pretty unflattering things uh, about women. He says that women are naturally uh, subordinate to men. So if you just kind of sat and went back and forth between positive and negative Prabhupada sayings on women and their roles, you could really go back and forth um, all day. So like, what's a devotee to do? Um, and certainly you could uh, qualify all this by saying, and this is said about a lot of teachers who say off color things like, oh, they, have transcendental knowledge, but they're also speaking with like the idiom of their times, um, where they're speaking with like this idiom that is no longer applicable in some of their style. Um, so definitely people have already made like these kind of apologetics too. Um, a historical precedent for female initiating gurus in ISKCON that Prabhupada mentioned that a lot of people mentioned a little bit of a refrain is a uh, figure from the time of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, named Janava Devi. So Janava is this like legendary devotee. Um, she was one of the wives, uh, he had two wives of Nityananda who was an associate of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Janava has all these pastimes associated with her and she's said to have been this like very powerful personality. Um, she toured around with like thousands of followers and so forth. And she was not merely like a teacher or a revered personality, um, but she was actually properly an initiating guru. So the story is that um, another devotee saw her in her kind of divine form, her forearmed transcendental form. And he was so, uh, struck with admiration for her that he like asked that she be his initiating guru. So Janava is a little bit interesting as a precedent for a Diksha guru. And I think she is, she's useful, but people could also uh, slide around female initiating gurus just with Janava because she also has this kind of divine status too. So somebody arguing against female initiating gurus could always say Janava is an exception. Um, she's actually this divine incarnation. She's not a normal woman. Um, Janava, like Nityananda and Chaitanya are said to be incarnations of personalities from the eternal spiritual world. Um, so they have this kind of dual status. So basically just as Chaitanya is uh, an incarnation of both Radha and Krishna, Janava um, has these different identities of gopis that are attributed to her. Um, the gopis like these associates or uh, eternal handmaidens of Radha and Krishna. So I'm not sure if Janava herself like only was enough of a precedent um, because certainly people cited her but yet didn't allow uh, female initiating gurus to. Another interesting thing is that this whole Godaya Vaishnava Bhakti Yoga lineage um, definitely has a history of innovation and of pushing boundaries. So if Prabhupada, when he came to the West, um, introduced all these new roles for Westerners and introduced all these new roles for women, this was actually um, kind of appropriate uh, to the tradition for him to do. So this wasn't an innovation that was out of nowhere. So kind of in that vein, um, Prabhupada's guru 
um, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur um, already argued that any initiated Vaishnava um, had like powers to carry out functions equal to uh, somebody of the Brahmin ca uh, caste. So he argued against the caste system. He argued um, that it was again about qualifications. It was about initiation and it wasn't about like previous ancestry. So at the time um, in like the 19 teens and 1920s um, when Bhakti Siddhanta was arguing this, this caused a lot of shock um, in Bengal. Apparently it even caused uh, death threats to him because he argued it like very successfully using Shastra, using references from tradition and so forth. So Bhakti Siddhanta also already was sending uh, missionaries to the West. So he had this idea that Bhakti Yoga was for not just like uh, for Indians, but for Westerners. And he was the one who charged uh, Prabhupada before he was actually called Prabhupada to spread this message to the West as well. So it's got like a very uh, universalist, it's got a very kind of revolutionary tradition. I will say that Godaya Vaishnavism or Bhakti Yoga isn't just the tradition of no tradition, um, just to put like a bookend on it on the other side. So it's not the tradition of doing whatever you want as long as you have devotion. Um, one theme that you see a lot of in the statements of Prabhupada are statements against uh, sahajyas. So sahajyas are people, well, they have a lot of associations, but they're people with like an easygoing approach to devotion. Um, they're actually practitioners of a lot of folk devotional traditions from Bengal, but for Vaishnavas, uh, sahajyas had like an overly permissive attitude, as Prabhupada said, uh, they will smoke cigarettes, and at the same time, they'll talk of Rasa Leela of divine pastimes. So he's like, you can't just do whatever you want, even though you can do a lot. Um, in ISKCON, probably the years uh, after Prabhupada left his body could be seen as the uh, nadir, like the lowest point of women's rights in general. Um, so if Prabhupada had this kind of hopeful time period that was more dynamic, um, you definitely see like a backsliding in the 70s and the 80s in ISKCON. In the Hare Krishna movement in general, this was also just generally like a bad time. Uh, most historians of the movement would say when there was a lot of corruption and a lot of uh, various abuse of a lot of kinds. So this is the kind of time when there was a lot of bad press of the movement and you had people looking at it basically like, why would anybody join uh, a movement that is abusive to women? Um, it had at these time, um, all these abusive leaders, a lot of people who got removed from power later on. Um, so yeah, it was the definitely kind of like bad adolescence of the Hare Krishna movement say. So um, in the later 80s, you start to see actually a lot of women who were uh, Prabhupada disciples kind of try to find their voice and push for what they felt was women's like original involvement or really their original role uh, in ISKCON. So starting in the late 1980s, you see women push to be given a lot of these roles back. Um, and first, it's not even to have uh, female initiating gurus. The first step is just for women to be allowed to give classes on devotional literature, uh, like the Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, so in 1988, Pranada Dasi uh, writes this extensively researched letter um, that women should be allowed to give Bhagavatam classes in ISKCON temples. And she gets branded like a women's liver um, and basically becomes this like ostracized person for it. Um, yeah, I, I've chatted with her like a little bit on this time period. And she was like, yeah, she definitely like remembers like people uh, kind of coming at her and how vehement it was. Um, she was really able to give a lot of Prabhupada quotes in support 
um, of women's equality and women's teaching roles. So she says, quoting him, every one of us living entities, we are part and parcel of the Supreme Lord. The outward dress, man and woman, that is dress. So it wasn't until 2000, um, to give an idea of how much it needed to catch up, that um, ISKCON's governing board finally makes a resolution that reauthorizes women to give classes. And it also uh, starts to apologize for past shortcomings. Um, this resolution that apologized for past bad treatment of women begins, um, whereas it's clearly following in our line that all people are welcome to join Lord Chaitanya's Sankirtan movement and are capable of developing full love of God. So again, it's echoing back this original uh, egalitarian uh, mission of Godaya Vaishnavism. Um, it also links women's bad treatment to a lot of the other issues um, that beset ISKCON during the 70s, 80s, early 90s. Just this idea that authoritarianism, that stifling people's voices in general, obviously this is gonna lead to bad uh, results in organizations. So the push for female gurus went on a while. Um, and you don't get till uh, 2021. So this is really like present day now. Um, ISKCON's governing board uh, allowing that Vaishnavis, uh, female devotees are eligible to, uh, to give diksha, to give initiation. Um, so this isn't like the first female initiating guru. This is just the governing board saying that women are eligible. It still gives these uh, qualifications but a lot of the qualifications are also um, like generic. So they would be like uh, applicable to anyone. The resolution C seems a little bit problematic. This idea that you have to be in a stable family situation, but notice it's not only to be in a family to be married. It could also be a woman in a uh, Vaishnava or Vaishnavi Sangha. So it could be a woman in a community who has like a stable situation too. So it does give a little bit of provision for like a non-married person. Another reason that was a little bit more practical to, uh, to open up the door, at least for the possibility of female initiating gurus was the need to increase the overall number of gurus worldwide. Um, so ISKCON noted that the number of initiating gurus today it is about the same as what they had in the mid eighties, but the number of overall devotees had just skyrocketed worldwide. So this is kind of similar to the Catholic church uh, experiencing a priest, a priest shortage and also contemplating, hmm, maybe we want to bend a little bit with women's ordination. So just to finish up, um, and this was kind of convenient that this just happened. Uh, I obviously didn't plan this. It just kind of worked out well. So you actually have the first um, initiation by a female guru uh, just happened um, like a, a couple of weeks ago. So this was on August 19th, 2022 uh, on Janmastami or Krishna's appearance day. So you have, uh, Narayani Devi Dasi, who was a Prabhupada disciple, become the first official Diksha guru within ISKCON. Um, this was down in the ISKCON community in Alachua, Florida. Um, so she actually did initiate um, like a, another female devotee, as you see in the picture. So in short, this has been like, well, it's actually, kind of like a, an unflattering story for somebody who is at least loosely involved in bhakti yoga and the Hare Krishna movement. Um, but it's an interesting story and it's encouraging that um, women's equality is rooted in Vaishnava theology. And it does seem to have a lot of precedence in this devotional culture, this idea that we are not our bodies. Um, that the true measure of a guru should be qualification and should be service. It shouldn't be somebody's outward um, physical form. So hopefully 
uh, the Hare Krishna movement can join uh, other organizations to in journeying towards uh, women's full equality and the affirmation of both women's teaching uh, and their spiritual initiatory uh, power. Great, so we have a little time here. Thank you so much, Trish. That's really a rich and more detailed look at a specific community and the evolution of the role of the guru there. Um, and really interesting comparisons with the Catholic church. I know Trish has written successfully, uh, done a few comparative pieces for Tarka Journal um, that are comparative. And I'd love to see that like more fleshed out um, just because there's some interesting um, interesting moments there that I'd love to hear more about or think more fully about. I wanted to, uh, as a moderator for this panel, I thought maybe it would be helpful if I returned to the original description of the panel and just the final line that you, um, uh, that the three of you offered here, um, because I think all of you successfully spoke to this intention and maybe this uh, reframing and kind of orienting back towards this intention could help uh, you know, push the discussion forward in a fruitful way. Um, as we said initially uh, in this panel, um, and it was outlined that all three of our guest speakers here are scholar practitioners, and, and Ken Rose spoke about that uh, quite a bit in his talk, but that all three would explore the role of the guru, the overlaps and differences between guru and teacher, some common misconceptions, and how this role may evolve in our unboundaried modern times when ideas flow freely between East and West. Um, so just wanted to put that out there, this overlap between guru and teacher, these misconceptions. Um, and I think um, Hari Kirtana Das really was helpful in outlining specifically what a guru is traditionally and perhaps how that role might be evolving. Um, Ken brought up these important ideas about the scholar practitioner and how that shines a different perspective on the role of the teacher and the guru and um, what that's becoming. And so looking at the role of women in guru traditions and also maybe more broadly within the yoga community. Um, so I, I guess I'll open it back up and see, um, uh, would one of you like to jump in here? <laughs> For me, what I, I think what would what would tie these three papers, these three presentations together? If I had a question right now, yes. Hmm. What's the common theme or what's the common untheme? Is, is there some tension between the three? I didn't see or experience any particular tension, although if we talked about it more, one might, some tension might arise. Um, but I thought what we spoke about, what each of us spoke about um, was more complementary. Um, we have the um, traditional qualification of a guru and the distinction between a traditional guru and a modern teacher who is not going to be held to the same standard of uh, frankly, character development by virtue of um, a, a kind of practice designed for control of the senses and detachment from material uh, enjoyment. Um, and the tradition does not um, conflict in any way with the idea of a scholar practitioner. Uh, in fact, um, there is some expectation of a scholarly uh, attribute in, in a guru who is well-versed in uh, scriptural knowledge. Um, and certainly from the standpoint of the transcendental goal of yoga to uh, overcome the misidentification of the uh, not self, the contemporary material body as the self, then uh, the idea that uh, anyone who meets that qualification, irrespective of the nature of their birth, would be qualified to uh, teach uh, both the theoretical and the practical science. Um, 
one of the things that was interesting to me that I was thinking of uh, was uh, when a scholar practitioner uh, teaches the uh, general public, uh, as opposed to writing specifically for uh, an academic audience, um, there's the necessity of threading a, a needle because now you have to satisfy uh, both the academic audience, which has its standards, uh, and make teachings accessible to a general audience, uh, while at the same time acknowledging the or validating uh, the practice, uh, the observance. Uh, so, uh, Kano, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that uh, balancing act you know, for for a scholar practitioner and, and how one goes about navigating that that space. Well, you know that's a that's a good question, uh, Hari. Uh, when I was uh, Hari Kirtana, when I was uh, putting this together, I I put together one of my closing the uh, closing uh, comments was to be uh, about. Your, the different audiences that we have when we teach in a university, if I can't get to that page there for some reason. Um, and uh, I'll just read that to you, I have it here. Um, many minds, the same person might be of many minds about the issue. So this, this question, what are, who, who is our audience? Who is our constituency? Depends on whether one's speaking to undergrads, majors, non-majors, to your guru, to your PhD advisor, to grad students at the AAR, in a yoga studio, at a house of worship, to parents of students, to the dean, to the provost, to one's family and to oneself. It's, that's why I said this is a, a loose concept, the scholar practitioner. And uh, it's, 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 it's hard to find one um, um, definition that will serve uh, equally in all contexts. And because I taught undergraduates uh, for so many decades, thousands and thousands and thousands of students passed through my classroom. I must have taught intro to world religions over a hundred times besides upper level courses. And, uh, and so in, in the Tarker journal, I think it was Christopher, um, uh, I, I forget, uh, uh, Harish no. Wallace. Yes. Yeah, Christopher Wallace. Oh, oh Christopher, Christopher Wallace. Wallace. I think he very nicely pointed out really how different it is when you're dealing with undergraduates came to our come to our classrooms, one of the most popular courses in the university, but they came because they wanted to know about these different ways of being human. They, they had spiritual questions, they had issues they wanted to work out. But scholars of religious studies generally have a different uh, motivation. They, they want to teach them how to think about the material conditions out of which a practice arose. And frankly, most people aren't interested in that. And the study of religion has become almost utterly irrelevant as a discipline, both within the university, because it has no clear methodology. It borrows from other traditions. And in, in my university, it's, met, it's, fu it's basically functioned as a way to keep the philosophy department from going under, which uh, I did and, uh, and that we hired many people over the years to keep the philosophy department from getting axed by the state government because we just increased the enrollment, but undergraduates. And um, so I think that the study of religion method methodologically would do better to go back to an older model, excuse me. <coughs> and that was back in the model of someone like an Iliada. <coughs> um, and the idea that the study of religion looks for the spiritual dimension of human existence and tries to put it in a pluralistic context. <laughs> I'm going to stop for a moment. Okay. I, I guess like I, I guess like it, while you're while you're having a frog in your throat, um, it does seem to be problematic that uh, almost like the study of politics and ideology in the present day academy and in like popular popular learning, it talks more convincingly about like the human spirit and what motivates people than maybe religious studies. Like as Ken was saying, like religious studies can have this like almost stubbornly sociological approach that it has to kind of boil everything down to the cultural context and the material conditions. 
um, and what have you. And then, uh, yeah, like it's, it's like the glamorization of politics, of ideology, of those sorts of studies. Um, and I guess like with that, for uh, the scholar practitioner of religion of spirituality, um, not only is there the problem of like, how do you make the field like appealing and how do you make it like, how do you put a why to study it for undergrads or for new grad students um, on the one hand? And then how do you avoid like being overly uh, performative yourself as a scholar practitioner? Because as, uh, as you said, Ken, like a person can have many different versions of themselves that they present to different people. Um, so how do you maintain a sense of genuineness within all mm -hmm. that? Like you don't, well, I, I feel like I could be in danger of like going to the temple and being like, ah, oh, and being like, I'm this person and then going and presenting a paper and being like, I'm this person. Um, so what's a scholar practitioner to do? Or do you just be comfortable with being like, I don't know, being a little bit uncomfortable in all these different roles, I guess? You know, um, sociology and culture plays into the issue of should women be diksha gurus as well? Um, now that we, I think of it, there was a, a tension that I thought of uh, while you were speaking about that issue. Um, the tension uh, between Gaudiya Vaishnavism in the West and Gaudiya Vaishnavism in India, because that's where the uh, argument now is insofar as the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, it's an international society. And therefore what happens in the West is felt by uh, members of the society in India. Um, it's also felt in Russia and there are issues there, but specifically with the uh, issue of uh, women taking the role of Diksha Guru, uh, the tension is between India and particularly North America and, and Western Europe. And I'm wondering if you had uh, anything to say about that that fell out of the range of what you could speak about in the time that you had. Oh, no, I didn't speak about it on purpose because I didn't want to uh, get into like any risk of, I don't know, like the whole, well, that that is like a tension that I'm aware of, like between ISKCON India and ISKCON in the West and so forth. But there's so many other like cultural issues intertwined with that. Mm -hmm. um, but ISKCON in India, it does seem like a good example of, um, what do they call it? The pizza effect of like, you know, a culture, like a religion, a practice journeying from its original country to the West. Like pizza wasn't like, we experience it today in its original Italian form. And then it, it came to the US and it became like this Chicago style, whatever monstrosity that we know it as. And then that westernized pizza journeyed back to Italy. And so thus with uh, ISKCON in the West, um, this like whatever like Vedic 1960s thing um, like got real popular and then it journeyed uh, back to India and now I guess it's like also flourishing there too. Um, so yeah, it's complicated. And then it like remixed with um, like India debating itself on what its culture is all about. Um, but yeah, like I guess uh, I, I was thinking about the tension between ISKCON India, ISKCON North America. I have no idea how to solve it. Um, like the best thing I can think of is just to have female uh, female diksha gurus and let people like be upset and then gradually work it out because most people like get over their upsetness eventually. It should be noted for the benefit mm -hmm. of our audience who probably doesn't have the same kind of inside information that I do, mm -hmm. uh, that the objections to uh, women Diksha gurus in ISKCON is coming from India, but is, it is not coming from Indians. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, people who are actually the rabble rousers on this. 
our Western uh, devotees, uh, uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavas, who moved to India and decided they liked this conception of uh, some idealized Vedic civilization that somehow or other does not include women as gurus. So even though the India is the geographic location of the uh, um, conflict uh, with the Western uh, uh, ISKCON establishment, it is Westerners in India that are actually raising uh, the biggest objections uh, and uh, mo uh, mobilizing the Indian Yatra uh, to protest this uh, terrible, terrible development. I mean, it is like very terrible. Um, but yes, I did notice that like a lot of the videos against uh, women initiating gurus were like this very stoic looking devotee with some kind of Eastern European accent wearing Vedic garb. Um, it seemed to be like a theme. Anyhow, not to get too far down that hole, like it's inter a bit of a hole and it's very on politics. Yeah. Um, let's see how to bring it back. Yeah, that's, 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 yeah. Uh, that that phenomenon, the pizza effect, is wonderful. Recently, Domino's. Uh, I'm in Europe. Domino's had tried to conquer Italy, <laughs> and they they, they, they failed. Really they failed. They've oh. closed their 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 franchises. Yes, they didn't oh. succeed. Um, and so I, it's often the case that converts to religious traditions, I mean, this is a known phenomenon, are much more radical, but they also have a, they don't have that intimate understanding of the tradition that people who were born in it. And the convert will often scorn the person as being lax, but they have it in their, in, in their skin, in their bones. And the convert often brings their own culture with them. This is also known about converts. And what I've noticed about ISKCON over the years is, and I was just reading something and it came from India and it seemed to me, ah, it was an Ind it was a woman, a famous woman in India. She's a best-selling writer. She's written about Shiva. She went to an ISKCON temple and the, the, the devotees, the devotees, she felt that they insulted Shiva by saying he was just a demigod and that she needs to, and he, she said, this didn't sound like Hinduism to me. It sounded like some, sounded like some Western religion with, with Hindu clothing on. And I think that's what actually happens and happened in that case is just too much imported from uh, from fundamentalism in America into that mindset. Having been a fundamentalist in two different religions back in the day, I, I'm a little bit uh, I'm sensitive to this phenomenon. Uh, and I, I, I do think that the resistance to to women being a Diksha gurus in, in ISKCON um, probably will pass because other other movements have succeeded. Satchin Ananda's Integral Yoga, for instance, if you go to Yogaville in Virginia, the, 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 the leading figures are, are women swamis. They're not called swamini, they're called swami. And uh, also in Arshavidya Garukalam uh, from Swami Dayananda, there are many, many women uh, swamis initiating gurus. So they have the title swamini, but still they're at the same level as the, as the men. So uh, I think I think it's only a, a really a matter of time. Before, perhaps you're right that that time will will be the healer here. <laughs> I mean, like the the one like material advantage of time is if there's like an older, more strict generation, then it tends <laughs> to remove them. But then the problem is there's also usually like a young, strict generation coming up mm -hmm. who, as you said, they have that like convert fanaticism. Um, well, in we, the instance yeah, of the Hare Krishna movement, a lot of these people who are younger are yeah. um, uh, children of people who were converts. Yeah. And therefore, uh, for them, it is second nature. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, there is a lot of uh, frustration uh, amongst uh, those people with uh, the institution. Uh, and it should be noted that although ISKCON is uh, the preeminent institution of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, particularly in the West, it, it does not constitute the entirety of the Hare Krishna movement. Uh, there's a, a big soft pillow of Hare Krishna-ness <laughs> around that institution now. And I personally will be interested to see uh, 
what that uh, soft uh, group uh, around the hard institution coalesces into uh, mm -hmm. as the uh, uh, institution ages out, or at least the current leadership of, of the institution ages out. I wonder if I could jump in with a question, because I noticed really uh, this is the topic of the role of the guru is such a broad topic that crosses a, uh, over to so many different traditions um, within Hinduism. And we have this really interesting, specific look into the, the Krishna community. Um, but Hari Kirtana, your talk was really actually a little bit broader in a sense, and you highlighted a couple of points. Um, I was taking notes, but I think it was something about this kind of the idea. It resonated this, you, the words you used were flawless embodiment that we kind of expect that the true guru would be this flawless embodiment of a supernatural being that mm -hmm. we have some sort of expectation of uh, that when we say the word guru, we imagine somebody on a pedestal and they need to earn that pedestal continuously throughout, you know, the, in terms of, and, and they should maintain that certain standard. And then I think about Ken's presentation that looked at this scholar practitioner topic, you know, more broadly. And I, I wonder in there, I don't have a really precise question, but I wonder actually for, um, my question is really kind of for Ken in terms of, and maybe for also for Trish and, and Hari to think about, but, um, how you imagine maybe the scholar practitioner relating to replacing, becoming a kind of guru that is going to be probably not as flawless, even in popular imagination as the traditional guru, because we have professors that we admire and look up to, but they're not on the same level as a guru, but they might be actually you know, catalytic they might be transformative, the encounter with a really good teacher on any level at any place in time can, you know, become that, so. That's a really uh, interesting observation, a good point. I, I know that uh, through the years, the, the over 30 years of teaching, that I probably had a, an influence on many, many students who were inclined towards various kinds of fundamentalism. They, 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 were, they became more pluralistic I know because I had students come back occasionally and tell me, tell me that. But I also know that stories about me spread throughout all the high schools of Virginia about, you know, he's the kind of professor either you want to take or you want to avoid when you go down there or up there or over there, because, you know, uh, this is challenging and it's extremely challenging for a lot of young people to come into an intro to, intro to religion class. My own view is that I always was a practitioner I never stopped being a practitioner. The only time in my life when I felt the least motivated spiritually was at the end of my doctoral studies. I have to say that after that nine year process, I was utterly drained and I felt as if I had been completely run over by Western ideology. I had almost taken it on board. And it was a long, slow healing process to, to rediscover my own spiritual path, but I did. And it's a pluralist spiritual path that draws upon many traditions. I'm deeply shaped clearly by Gaudiya Vaishnavism, but also by the Catholic upbringing, my Catholic upbringing, but later in deep encounters with, uh, with Catholic mysticism, very important for me. And of course, I had a, there was a period of involvement with evangelicalism as well. It all shaped me, but then also my own academic study, my pluralistic study of multiple mystical traditions have fed deeply into my own spiritual growth. And, and so I, I, I'm not just a person who talks about religion. I'm a person who actually tries to, to live a spiritual life. And, and so I would never put myself on the level of a guru. And I never had that relationship to students. But in my retirement now, as I reach out more broadly through more popular publications and through Substack and, and other venues, I find that I'm actually sharing as a spiritual teacher, which is a new role for me than just a professor. And I think in a different context, I might have been a spiritual teacher. Let's say I had stayed in the Krishna movement or I had become a Catholic priest, perhaps, or a monk. But that, but I, that didn't happen. But I'm finding my voice now, and I'm not looking for that voice. I just think it comes from many years of practicing these traditions. We do have something to say to the next generation 
Um, and they, they'll take it much further, just like the Alan Watts and the Paul reps only got so far and we took it a really long distance since then. People who are 20, 30 today, they are, we don't even know where they're going to take spirituality with the freedom and the pluralism that we have. It's all, I mean, it's all, I, I think it will definitely be part of the, of a re restoration of a kind of, or a creation of a new, more spiritual humankind. I, I really, um, I just want to respond on that. I really appreciate that kind of reframing. And it's, I find that very helpful thinking of this reframing this topic of the guru into something like a spiritual teacher, because it does this, you know, it, it enables in a sense, a step away from this idealizing of an, in, of an individual, but it's at the same time can value if you spent 30 years teaching and working with mm -hmm. students and you spent decades involved with religious and spiritual communities, you have something different to offer than someone who's spent two or three years in those communities or studying, you know, so we want to have, I think there is this space where we need to be able to value kind of that dedication, commitment and time and of investment. But at the same time, the many of the problems that arise out of guru communities, that guru kind of terminology can be related, I think, to this, um, you know, kind of sense of, um, of idealizing what that person ought to be on both sides. <laughs> yeah. on, on that, I guess uh, I didn't mean to like, like cut anyone off or something, but uh, I guess like an interesting thing that touches on kind of what Ken was saying was, um, yeah, there's like a, an insight and a depth that comes with experience, I say as like, the, the youngest of the three of us by far. Um, but uh, you. <laughs> you what? Thanks. <laughs> I mean, I'm like maybe one or two years younger. Like, that's all. I'm <laughs> clearly the oldest, so yeah. <laughs> I'm clear. We're not, we're not um, fine. Yeah. But, uh, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's uh, not great sometimes of all the three uh, intellectual spheres that we talked about. We talked about like the kind of traditional religious and spiritual and then we talked about the academic and then we talked about the world of modern postural yoga um it's definitely counterproductive in the like world of modern postural yoga that you kind of have to put yourself out there as like this person or this authority um in a way that i think rushes people to like teach and to have opinions on things like before they're cooked uh, already and I've seen like people teaching yoga less years than I have and they you know like do like a shtick and they have like their I don't know their teacher business and this whole thing and then they like burn out and they disappear mm. and then they reemerge a couple of years later and they're like oh yeah I was actually like trying to talk about all this and putting all this pressure on myself like before I was uh before I was ready um so it, it's taken a lot of pressure off of me as somebody like kind of starting out on my teaching journey to realize that I don't have to have uh, all the answers right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't have to like set myself up as an authority and that just kind of practicing and being in this community is, is I guess part of the process. Um, and it's part of like uncovering whatever insights I hopefully like knock on wood might one day have um but yeah to to do all that i think people need uh encouragement to like push back against a lot of the commercializing pressures of mm -hmm. like modern day yoga land you know one of the one of the things i said when i was speaking about this is that um freedom from material desires or at least significant progress in the direction uh, and dedication to the process of becoming free from material desires is an essential characteristic to look for in a guru. And there's no reason why that cannot be uh, a quality found in a scholar practitioner. Um, two of my shiksha gurus, instructing gurus, are scholar practitioners. Um, and uh, a friend, I think a mutual friend, who's a scholar practitioner, uh, has... Uh, who's a little more well known as a scholar uh, has uh, accepted uh, disciples as well 
uh, fairly recently. So I definitely think that, uh, and, and, and I, I know a, a handful, personally, I know a handful of scholar practitioners who I think uh, are qualified and could take on that role uh, as uh, to, to live in both worlds, to be both a scholar and to be living uh, in the tradition, in the role of a guru in the, in the traditional sense of the word. So I see no reason why that uh, cannot happen. There's, there's no reason why the scholarship and the character development that comes from practice cannot go hand in hand. I, I would just say so. that uh, well, one, one, one comment is that um, when you're a professor at a university these days, it's, uh, it's not likely you're going to get caught up in some of the problems of, of a charismatic guru because, I mean, you're simply accountable to your behavior. And that's even, it's even more rigorous now than it was when I, when I started out as an academic uh, in the academic world 30, 35 years ago. Um, and also, um, so that's, that's, not, that's not as much of an issue, I, I would say, although character can find different ways of expressing itself. But I, I do think that if you, if you, in my experience, I think that these traditions have had their effect upon me. I'm not anywhere nearly as materialistic as many, many, of my relatives, people I know, people in the communities in which I live. I think my life is much simpler. Uh, um, we, we live comfortably, but we certainly live below our means. And we're not aspiring for a whole lot more than what we have because my wife and I are very much content with our spiritual practice. We're both yogis of long standing. And if you read the Bhagavad Gita on a regular basis, and how can you not be affected by by the and the Yoga Sutra, how can you not be affected by the practice of the yamas and the niyamas? So it has an effect upon us. Yes, we should uh, we should hope so over time. That's the big that's, that's the promise. <laughs> okay, well, I think we are we 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 are about at time here, and we've gone a little over time, in fact. Um, and I just want to extend uh, you know a gratitude. Uh, thank you, uh, Hari Kirtana, Ken, and Trish for uh, your wisdom and insight into this topic. And um, and thank you, those of you who are listening now to the talk afterward.